Well, good morning. I'm excited to be back. If you were here last week, you know I was not. We were away on vacation, and that was good to get away. We spent uh, a lot of time doing not a lot, uh, which if you know me, that's my favorite kind of a vacation. Uh, we pretty much were in the water every day by about nine. We floated in the water till we decided we were ready to eat something, and then we ate something, and then we floated in the water some more. And when we were tired of floating in the water, we played pickleball until our bodies hurt. And so we just had a lot of fun doing a whole lot of not a, a whole lot of nothing. And um, but it is good to be back, and appreciate as I always do uh, those who are willing to to step in and fill gaps uh, while I'm away and. So thank you to those who were a part of uh, making it possible for me to be able to get away. I do appreciate you. And uh, I've mentioned over the course of, uh, as we were in Romans and working through Romans, that we were going to take a little bit of a break once we got uh, to this, the, once we finished this section we were at in Romans. And, and so then the million dollar question becomes, you know, well, what are we going to do? And I'm gone last Sunday, and then I'm here for three Sundays, and then the church is sending our family uh, to a conference in Michigan, and so we'll actually be gone for two Sundays then, and so we're kind of uh, jumping around a little bit, uh, and then you find yourself, okay, so what, what, what are we going to do? You know, if we want to take a break from Romans, how do we um, maybe lighten the load a little bit, if we could put it that way, in the summer, and, and where we were at in Romans was very heavy. If you were here, you knew that to be true, and uh, I wish I could tell you that what we will take our time over the next few weeks looking at together will be less heavy but I'm not going to tell you that because I don't think that that's true. Um, I think it's a different kind of heavy. Um, as we were working our way through Romans and, and we're working up to chapter 3, verse 20, we were really challenged with this reality of, of considering the fact that God's judgment was coming against wickedness. And, and we were week after week encouraged to, to examine our hearts and see where we stood before the Lord. And, and so working through some of those things and and, um, and, and, you know, where I want to spend the next few weeks is talking about the reality of a healthy local church. And, um, you know, part of this for me really stems from the reality that as we think about in the church context, everybody that is involved in church wants to be a part, whether they know it or not, whether they've expressed it or not, likes to be a part, wants to be a part of a church that is healthy. It's really tough to be a part of a church that's not healthy, a church that is floundering, a church that is navigating difficulty constantly, a, a church that is stretched very thin. And it may seem to be a foreign concept to some of you to hear me talk about this reality of a, of a, of a healthy church, uh, but I do want to assure you that I stand by the fact that I believe people want to be involved in a church that is healthy. And people want to be a part of certain churches for a variety of reasons, right? Things like the Word of God is taught. That's a, a, a great reason to want to be involved in a given church. Uh, sometimes people want to be involved in churches because the children's program is good, uh, because they, the church aspires to make a difference in the community that it's within and to raise up people from within their walls to reach into that community. And all of this makes sense, <clears throat> excuse me, because... We all want to be a part of things, church or otherwise, that are making a difference, that are doing things worth talking about, that are, that are doing things that are, that are notable. Why does a young lady come before our congregation and other congregations weeks before going on a missions trip and ask you to pray for her and ask you if the Lord would lay it upon your heart to support her? And, and, and she goes and she's a part of this cause. And when she comes back, why does she share with us? Because she was a part of something, as long, along with some of the other kids who are here, I understand are part of the team, who were a part of something that made a difference. The kids that they connected with in Cape Town are different now because of the fact that they were there. And so they come back and they want to tell us about it. Why do they want to tell us about it? Why do we want to hear about it? Because it made a difference. We all want to be a part of things that make a difference. And here's the reality. The church is no different. People who aspire to be godly want to be a part of a church that is making a difference in the world and that is glorifying to the Lord. If you aspire to be a godly person, this is natural. You want to be a part of a church that's making a difference. 
The reality, though, I think we have to pause and give some consideration to the, the, the truth that there is no great accomplishment without great sacrifice. We don't make a difference accidentally. We don't reach into the lives of people. Like, is there a world where this team of young people could have connected with the folks in South Africa and, and, and made, it, made a difference and made it into it? Yes, probably. But the difference that was made was much greater because of the sacrifice that was necessary. It took time. It took energy. It took effort. It took prayer. It took sacrifice. When I was a college student, now I wasn't a believer in Jesus at the point of college before I went away to Bible college. Serving Jesus and connecting with people was not on my priority of sacrifices to make. But for some young people it was. And we see this reality that there is no great accomplishment without great sacrifice. Whether it's a victory in a battle, whether it's achievement in a classroom, whether it's accomplishment in the sports arena, or whether it's the payment for sin and death that results in salvation. There is nothing worth having that's not worth sacrificing for or that did not require sacrificing for. And I want you to know this morning that that's true for the local church as well. And, 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 and there's a reality where I think we understand some of the things that I just said. Well, there was a sacrifice that was necessary for salvation to be offered. We understand that. But lots of times there then becomes a disconnect between the sacrifice that was necessary for my salvation was a call for me to sacrifice of myself for the benefit of others and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, my salvation isn't about me. I'm not the hero of the story. I am a sinner saved by grace who understands or has a growing understanding of what had to take place in order for me to have that salvation. And the more I understand what was necessary and the more I understand what that salvation is, the more the only natural response is I want to make others aware of this too. We do not fully grasp and understand, understand a salvation that we keep to ourselves. That is the antithesis of biblical salvation. That's antithesis, uh, the antithesis of the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ to go and to make disciples. If the local church is to be healthy, then those who are a part of the local church must be willing to sacrifice. And it's not just a couple people. It's not just those who are in leadership. It takes the body as a whole for the body to thrive and to be healthy. There are various sacrifices that believers need to make. They must make for the sake of the advancement of the gospel. And what I want to do over the next three weeks is look at three different areas of necessary sacrifice for the health and vitality of the church. And this morning is the, as you see on the screen before you, the sacrifice of servanthood. If the church is going to be healthy, if the church is going to accomplish her mission, then those who would profess to make up the church must engage in the work of the church. And listen, that's a local thing. When we talk about local church, we're talking about this is the local church. Our body of believers here that make up Dale Bible Church, that's the local church. But there's a reality that everything that's done on the local church level, all of the gospel advancement that's made on the local church level is also impacting on the universal church level. And that is the, the church all across the globe, all believers for all time since the church age began. And the reality is, all of us are called to the sacrifice of service if the church is to be healthy, not just some of us. Servanthood is not limited to those who are skilled. It is not limited to those who are youthful. It is not limited to those who are willing. It is not, though, it is not limited to those who need to do something or for any other reason. 
The reality is the sacrifice of servanthood is not limited to anyone, but it is expected of everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ. You might recall, <clears throat> we read things like, you know, we lay down our lives and we keep it. But if we keep it, we, we lose it. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Well, it doesn't profit him anything. The reality is, is the laying down of our lives is the willful acknowledgement, the laying down of my life in salvation, that Jesus has accomplished what I most desperately need, and I cannot accomplish it for myself. Understanding who He is and understanding what He has wrought in salvation is a call for me to die to myself. It is not me who lives, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, <clears throat> but it is Christ who lives through me. So service is necessary for the advancement of the gospel, not just in our generation, but throughout church history and throughout whatever generations would follow us. Consider the words of the Puritan John Owen. He says this, God has work to do in this world, and to desert it because of its difficulties and entanglements is to cast off his, his, that is, God's authority. Universal holiness is required of us that we may do the will of God in our generation. It is not enough that we be just, that we be righteous, and walk with God in holiness, but we must also serve our generation as David did before he fell asleep. God has work to do. Listen to the last part. God has work to do, and not to help him is to oppose him. Most people who profess faith in Jesus Christ do not consider themselves as someone who is opposing God or opposing what God is seeking to accomplish. And, and what is John Owen doing here? He's calling the people of the church to action. He's calling them out of idleness. He's calling them out of passivity. He's calling them to action. He's reminding them that to do the will of God is to be about advancing the gospel of God, being a part of completing the work that he has to do in our generation. The old expression is this, for such a time as this. This is why we are here. To not help, that is to say, to not do the work of God, for us is to oppose Him. And this is a lofty statement, really. Because the irony in this statement is that God has need of nothing. He does not need us to do anything. And that's the reality of understanding servanthood and understanding sacrifice. God doesn't need us to do his bidding, but God has called those who have embraced uh, salvation by grace through faith to be a part of what he's doing. And there's a reality that the expectation of someone who understands the implications of the gospel, the reality is that they would live those implications out and that they would live in obedience to the gospel. And so while God needs nothing, he calls us to service. He calls us to be a part of what He is accomplishing. He is doing His work. He's accomplishing His purposes. And His desire and His expectation is that we would be workers. When I say we, I mean those who name the name of Jesus Christ would be workers in this cause. And how is it that John Owen says we are to be workers? We serve our generation as David did before he fell asleep. Not looking to someone else to do it, not waiting for someone else to come along, but it's understanding the reality. <clears throat> Excuse me, Neva shared with us, they engaged with a kid in South Africa who had never heard of Jesus. And she even said, you know, in some ways we're kind of like, man, that's hard for us to compute, right? Because it's, it's crazy to think that we live in a world where, you know, people haven't heard about Jesus. But it makes sense, you know, in Africa. There's probably people in Africa who haven't heard about Jesus. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. There are people in your neighborhood who have never heard of Jesus. Beyond 
profanity or whatever, however he's using it. There are people all around us who have never heard the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so the call ultimately here from John Owen is that we would redeem the time. Our days are numbered, so we must redeem the time. We must be faithful to what God has called us to. God has called us to serve, to serve the Lord and to serve others. And as we talk about service as a sacrifice and as it being necessary for the health of the church, I want to start this morning by examining the model that we have of service. This, of course, our model is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our model. And so we're looking to our model. And I, I, we've got selected scriptures that we're going to look at this morning. They will be on the screen. So if you're a note taker, you might just write the, the passages that we'll look at down there. And then you can go back and, and look into them in a little greater detail if you'd like. But as we think about our model, I want to see three things about the model that is Jesus Christ. The first, I want us to examine the explanation of the model. And this is a, a phenomenal passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Again, if you've got your Bible, you can follow along. If not, it is on the screen there in front of you because we'll be doing some flipping. And so if you can keep up, great. If not, it's on the screen. So I actually want to start in verse 1. So we'll get to 3 on the screen, but I want to start in verse 1. He says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit and any affection and compassion, fulfill my joy that you think, that you think the same way. By maintaining the same love, being uni un united in spirit, excuse me, thinking on one purpose, doing nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The model of service is Jesus Christ. It's the bottom line. That's the model. He is who we look to as a demonstration of this model. A model is defined as a system or thing used as an example to follow or imitate. It's fitting, isn't it? If Jesus is our model, Jesus, when he began calling people to ministry, to service for him, how did he invite them? Follow me, he said. Follow me. The reality, salvation is an invitation to follow Jesus. And that's what a model does. A model sets a course of action for those who would come behind them to follow or to imitate. And we could absolutely make the argument that the greatest demonstration of his servanthood was that of laying down his life as a payment for sin, excuse me, to appease the holy wrath of God. And I would argue that for sure this is the pinnacle of his servanthood demonstrated. But you know, oftentimes around Easter or Christmas, we'll talk about which is more significant, the virgin birth or the resurrection. Well, there is no resurrection if there's no virgin birth. And, and similar to the reality that there is no sacrifice of self as payment for sin if there's not first what we just read about here in Philippians 2, Jesus laying aside his heavenly abode. Though he was in the form of God, he was equal with God, he thought this equality a thing not to be grasped, and he took on flesh, and he became a man. He, he, Paul, Paul says here in verse 7 that he took on the form of a what? A slave. That is a servant. And this is the reality of what Paul is, is writing about here. He's writing about what Christ has done. And notice what he says about Christ and Christ's motivations. His motivation is not selfish. They're not for his own glory. 
His motivation is an act of humility where he regards others as more important than himself. See, Paul writing to the Philippians, he calls them to this way of life. And then he says, and your model for this is Jesus. This is what he did. This is how he did it. He's looking out for the interest of others. And just in case the Philippians were tempted to say something like, well, yeah, but he was God. That's what we might expect or anticipate that God would do. Paul says, have this way of thinking amongst yourselves. In Christ, you have the mind to think like, to, to understand the realities of servanthood, to understand the realities of sacrifice, to understand looking out not for your own interests, but the interest of others. Look, we live in a selfish world. And you know what the greatest Nah, I want to say grace. You know one of the greatest dilemmas in the church today is selfishness. In regards to looking out for the interest of others and setting self aside, I see very little difference between the church, the body of Jesus Christ, and the world that we live in. How, how does the church make a difference when she looks like the world? When she functions like the world? That's why Paul says, have this mind among you. Function this way. Look to this model of Jesus Christ. And the capacity and the ability to live selflessly is there because you are in Christ Jesus. But you will never live self selflessly, Philippians, if you look out for number one. Because notice what he said in the first part of this. He says, fulfill my joy in verse two, that you may think the same way. That doesn't mean be robots. Okay, but that does mean that you would be on the same wavelength. He says, by maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, functioning as a whole, functioning as one different from those outside. And again, we see the model that Paul is referring to of that of a slave is that of Jesus Christ. He was totally subject to the will of his Father. He was totally committed, not to his own needs, not to his own wants, not to his own desires, not to his own will, but he was totally committed to the will of his Father and to the good of others. And this is the model explained. Existing as a servant, and this means seeking to meet needs. Now, we've got, we've got some application later, but let's jump here for just a second. Every Sunday, I get up and I look at approximately 150, 160 to 200 people. And for, I've been here 10 years, the beginning of next year, and Dale Bible Church has been around as a Bible study, late 80s, as an organized, recognized body. This building was built in the mid-90s. And our kids' program has been something that has always taken place. And I'm not advocating for doing things just because they've always been done. Okay, that's not what I'm saying here. <clears throat> but what I am saying here is, brothers and sisters, it requires some inward introspection examination to understand that we have between 170 and 200 people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and we have one person that has offered to serve in our kids' ministry this fall. That's not a healthy church. And I understand that there's a lot of people serving in other areas, right? And, and, and we're not asking everybody, we're not asking a few people to do everything. <clears throat> the reality is, is this is a call for us to consider how might the Lord use us? Could the Lord use us in this way? How could I be a blessing? I may not, you know, as Jason did announcements, he said, you know, if your kids are a part of this ministry, you know, this is a great opportunity to help. And I would agree with that. But let me, let me, let me throw one more wrinkle in there. If your kids are not a part of this ministry, it's the perfect opportunity for you to help. Because you probably don't have kids that need to be cared for or that, that maybe are nursery age or that your kids have gone on past that. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to level with you. Far too many people in the church have the mindset that says, well, my kids are out of the nursery, so I don't need to serve in there. When you were a mom with small kids, 
Did you benefit from other people serving in the nursery when you could sit and be a part of church and hear God's word taught? Why, why don't we have the desire to afford that same opportunity for young moms today? And I'm not, that's, that's just, these are just examples that I'm giving, realities that we're living in. I am actually thankful, last I knew we had tons of nursery volunteers, thank you for that. Um, super thankful for those who serve in those areas. Um, but brothers and sisters, um, we can make a much greater dent when the body as a whole engages in serving. Uh, maybe it's not kids club, that's okay. You know, there's a lot of opportunities to, to dig in over the course of the summer. You know, VBS is huge, and a lot of you have stepped up to the plate. Thank you for that. We need that. VBS is a great thing that we're, that we're privileged to do every summer, and every year our numbers have gotten crazier and crazier and crazier, and it's an amazing time, and we're thankful for the volunteers. But to do long-standing ministry where we carry out on a routine basis, week after week ministry, we need volunteers. We need people who understand the reality that it's a sacrifice of servanthood to, her servanthood to be a part of these things. And we, you know, we recognize some of the dynamics and, and crazy things, but brothers and sisters, our model of service is Jesus Christ. How different would it be, might our salvation look, if Jesus said, well, I don't know, it's a pretty tall task I'm being called to. It's pretty uncomfortable to think about leaving the heavenly abode where everything is blissful and everything is great. That stinks, and I'm not really looking forward to that. And then there's the reality that in the end of my earthly life, I will be brutally beaten and murdered, and that just doesn't sound enjoyable or fun, and um, that's a lot of work, and that's a really big ask, so I just don't think I'm going to do that. And Paul tells us here that he didn't count the cost. He didn't take into consideration what he was leaving behind or what was coming ahead. He knew, but he willingly laid down his life. And he embarked on the task of servanthood and lived as our model. And brothers and sisters, I want to back up. Don't hear me say that Dale Bible Church isn't healthy because we have one volunteer. It's July. The Dale Bible Church, the demonstration, the fruit of a healthy church is that, you know, within the next few weeks, people have prayed about, they've, they've sought the Lord, and, and we've got volunteers, and we're carrying on these ministries. So I don't want anybody to freak out. Okay, that's not, that's not my point this morning. But a healthy church is a church that is made up of people who understand that Jesus was the model and that the invitation of that model is to follow him. Secondly, I want us to see the purpose of the model. Mark 10, 45, very familiar verse. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is Jesus speaking. And he says, this is why I came. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And the, 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 the greatest demonstration of that servanthood is to give my life as a ransom. Very succinct, right? Jesus came to serve, and this culminated in the service of self-sacrificing his life. The purpose of the model was the redemption of sinful man and the glory of the Father. The reality, as we've looked at, is there was no cost too great for the kingdom of God. There was no cost too great. Now, you and I, we may never be called to lay down our life physically and to die for the sake of the gospel. Most of us won't even be called into full-time vocational ministry. That is where ministry is your job. Most of us won't even be called into that reality. But is the thought of serving others even on the radar of those who make up the body of Christ today, both here and outside? When we think about service, when we think about ministries, is our heart stirred to, to, to be used how we could be used for the betterment of someone else? how my service, my willingness might be a part of advancing the gospel in someone else's life. 
Do we even think? Is it even, you know, on our, our radar? You know, we have to ask the question, are the individuals of the church fueled by the things that benefit them alone? Well, that ministry doesn't do anything for me, so I don't need to be a part of that. Well, that doesn't benefit me, so I don't really care if we do that or don't do that. Like, are our interests, are they inward? Are we fueled by the things that benefit us? Or is there a commitment to the overall mission of the local church that is Dale Bible Church and the universal church that is the body of Jesus Christ? Are we fueled by individual commitments and benefits or are we fueled by the overall commitment or the overall mission of the church? The purpose of Jesus' model was to show that the highest of prices wasn't too high. That sacrifice was necessary for the advancement of the gospel. To be willing to sacrifice in the area of service to others and Christ for the good of others and for the glory of Christ is the call of the church today. This is what we're called to. This is our purpose. And even you think beyond that, if you limit that to us, why do we exist? We say Dale Bible Church exists to do what? to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the Lord, we live the word, and we do what? We want to reach the people. We want to reach the people. This is the overall reality of what we desire and aspire to be about. Does that sound like you? That you want to be a part of that? Thirdly, I want us to see the method of the model. This passage was our call to worship this morning in John 13. I'll read a few verses. We're, again, familiar with it. But Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he's with his disciples in the upper room for the last time. He says, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Again, well-known passage of Scripture, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, including the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. And he says very plainly that he has given them an example and that his disciples should do as they have seen him do. This may be limited to washing feet, although I don't believe that's the case. The, the emphasis, the reality here is, is the emphasis is upon someone who doesn't necessarily have to be the servant, didn't need to be the servant, that's the reality of what we see in John 13, but willingly was the servant, and who did he serve? Even those who had no use for him. Even those who would turn on him. He set an example, quite the example really, Because he didn't just wash the feet of those who would do good for his cause. He didn't go partway around the table and then stop. He washed the feet of each man knowing that Judas would betray him. Knowing that Peter would deny him. Knowing that James and John were motivated by their own selfish interests and desires. Yet he washed all of these men's feet. Because he was a servant. And his example is one of servanthood. And his expectation is that those who name his name would be servants for his glory and for the good of others. So what he told his disciples, I have set an example for you to follow. You should do what I have done. You know, I want to say here as we work through this and we finish here with our model, in just a second we're going to look at what our motives are You know, I don't submit to you this morning that this is groundbreaking stuff. And a lot of realities, in a lot of ways, I guess I should say, a a lot of this is probably more of a reminder. Maybe it's a call to consider today, hey, are we fueled by service for others? Are we fueled by uh, the glory of the Lord? Are we looking to our example and our model? You may not leave here today and thank you. You may not hear anything new today. And and my goal in opening the Word of God and navigating it together is not always that we would discover something new. Now, there are lots of times when we look into God's Word and we learn things that we didn't know before. 
But sometimes we get into God's word and what we need is just to be reminded of where we've come up short. Where we've dropped the ball. Are we serving the Lord with a willing heart? Are we invested in seeing the gospel advance, the cause of Christ carried out throughout the world? We've seen our model. Jesus did those things. And so what's our motivations for doing them? Well, again, this is not groundbreaking stuff, but our primary motivation in living a life of servanthood is to glorify Jesus Christ. This is our primary motivation. Notice what Paul says to the church in Colossians, uh, the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we're doing. And sometimes I think when we talk about this arena of service in the church, you know, it kind of gets pigeonholed into some of the big things right? I understand, we as a leadership team understand everybody won't be called to serve in Community Kids Club. It's, there's many folks who make the ministry of Dale Bible Church work who are always behind the scenes, and that's okay. There's going to be a team of people this week, I will tell you, other than Holly Kern, because I know she's the one over-decorating for VBS, I have no idea who will be here this week. And when the week is over and this place looks like a jungle, I will have no idea who was here and was a part of that transformation this week. And that's okay, right? There's a reality that, that Paul is writing to Colossians. He says, whatever you do, understand that whatever you do, you're doing, why? As to the Lord. So do it for His glory. Don't be, don't, don't be a certain way, don't do a certain thing in order that you might receive notoriety. You may, and that's okay to be recognized for a job well done. But you do what you do because it's about bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our primary motivation. We want to see Christ glorified in the world that we live in. So it doesn't matter what we do, we must do it knowing that it's, the greatest reality is that it's for the glory of Christ. And that same reality means that we may never get a thank you. We may never on this side of heaven get a well done. We may never get a good job. That's okay. Because ultimately, we're serving for the glory of Christ anyways. The motivation for the sacrifice of servanthood is God glorified. And we need to be honest this morning. And this... I want to be clear, this is not a reference just to Dale Bible Church, okay? There's a lot of people running around today who name the name of Jesus Christ that are not concerned with his glory. And th some of those folks may be here in Dale Bible Church. We can't act like we're exempt from that reality. Lots of folks living their lives, professing faith in Jesus Christ, completely separate from any concept whatsoever of their lives being about his glory. That's not consistent with God's word. We see that that's the purpose. Our lives are about the glory of God. To profess Christ and live with disregard for his glory are ideas that are at odds with one another. They don't work together. Because to know Christ is to love Christ. You might say, oh, that sounds weird, you know, love Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Somebody who does for me what I cannot do for myself Changing my eternal destiny is somebody that's worthy of my love and adoration. And the more I know and understand that, the more I love and adore him. So to know him is to love him. And to love him is to embrace the work that he has left for the body of Christ. To love him is to embrace the work of making disciples, following after his example, and ultimately for his glory. Our service does benefit others, and we don't want to minimize that. We don't want to mitigate that reality. But God is glorified. People's lives are changed, and they are built up when the people of Christ live as servants for the glory of Christ. Secondly, our motive is to edify others. I'm going to give you two passages here. 1 Peter 4, 
As each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks as one speaking the oracles of God, whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. And then in Galatians 5, we see, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is, law is fulfilled in one word. In this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul and Peter, Peter and Paul, both make it abundantly clear that those who are in Christ should be seeking not only to serve for the glory of Jesus Christ, but to serve for the edification of the body. The reality of the church is that it's not about what I benefit, it's about what they benefit. As we said, does a mom benefit if I serve in the nursery? Does a dad benefit if I serve in the nursery? Yeah. Do kids benefit if I serve in kids club and help promote the, the teaching of the gospel and, and work in memory verses and all of these other things that go into that? Does, does that edify someone? Yeah. 100% it does. And those things also glorify the Lord. And we think of our children's church downstairs week after week, a whole parade of maniacs gets up and goes downstairs. Why? For the glory of Jesus Christ and the edification of those little minds that sit week after week after week under the Word of God brought to them on a level that's more geared for a small elementary age child than in our capacity here. Why? To edify them. That they might learn, that they might know, that they might grow, that they might come to know Jesus, and in coming to know Jesus, that they might love Jesus, and that in coming to love Jesus, they might serve Jesus. Peter and Paul make it clear, we ought to serve others for their edification. Both of these men teach, believers should be serving others and that when believers serve one another, the church is built up and Christ is glorified. The, the church, that's a, that's a promotion of health. And we see, we talked recently, Mother's Day and Father's Day. We went to Titus, and we saw what Paul had to tell Titus. What did he say? Older, teach the younger. Men and women alike, older, teach the younger. There's a reality of where these are the things that, that we see carried out in Scripture. We see the church called to in Scripture. Now, yeah, there's a reality where there is, in our context, an individual who is recognized as full-time staff who serves this body vocationally. But that does not mean that all of the edification that is necessary for the body is to come from me. If all the, edica if all the edification you get as a believer in Jesus Christ is what you get from me on a Sunday, we have missed the boat. We are living lives together, edifying one another, both corporately and together in smaller settings as we've talked about. Nowhere in Scripture do we see the call to serve on the basis of what we get out of it. But the irony is that there is a tremendous blessing that comes from serving others. There are few things as rewarding as seeing people begin to connect the dots of what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and to see them grow in His grace and in His truth. Again, after all, not to pick on Eva, what did she, what did she stand up here and say? One of the most rewarding things for me, I don't know if you use the word rewarding, I'm paraphrasing, was when we had taken, me and another girl, had taken a girl through the bridge diagram, and since I've left, she's communicated with me that she by herself took someone else through the bridge diagram. And of everything that she did, like I, I love lions and I'd love to go on a safari and see all the cool things that she got to see in South Africa. But that wasn't the highlight of her trip. That wasn't the, the greatest part of what she got to do. What was it? It was seeing someone who she had poured into begin to try to pour into someone else. Carrying out the model of what we see throughout Scripture, right? The reality is, 
service isn't about us, but when we serve from a pure heart with right motives, there's a tremendous reward and blessing in serving others. And so I want to finish this morning with four points of application. We're going to finish here. We've jumped around a lot, and I understand sometimes that comes with the territory of looking at <clears throat> these realities of servanthood and, and wanting to get a, try to get a, a, a more full picture. We've got a model, and we have motives. And so what do we need to know? What do we got to take away as we think about servanthood in the local church and the relationship to servanthood and the health of the local church? Number one, I need you to know this. There there is, go back for me, there you go, thank you. There is no room for selfishness in the local church, right? And I'm not saying that to, to sound harsh or as an indictment. We've walked through this. We've talked about this already, but it is a reality. This is the case. And what I mean, this is the case. There's no, self, there's no room for selfishness. This is the case because the local church is being built by Christ, and it is to follow his model that had no selfishness in it. He was selfless. And so if we're living selflessly, we're motivated by godly motives. But brothers and sisters, we're not uh, motivated by godly motives if our intentions are selfish. If we want what we want because we want it or how we want it or when we want it or the way we want it or why we want it or whatever, fill in the blank, I don't care. If our focus is ourselves, if our focus is living selfishly, that does not accord with godly motivations, okay? There's no room for selfishness, no selfishness in Christ, and for those who are part of his church as we follow his model, we must regularly be examining our motives. You know, the most deadly of sins I would submit to you is pride because it's so difficult to detect. Oftentimes when we struggle with pride, which is manifested in selfishness, we don't even know it because we're blinded by our pride, okay? There's no room for selfishness in the church. Number two, if you come to church because of how it makes you feel or what you gain from it, then you are gathering for unbiblical reasons. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not wrong to leave church and feel encouraged, to feel edified. That's that's what we see, right, taught in Scripture, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. I'm going to give you a quick example. This was years and years, this is probably 20 years, 2000, okay, maybe not 20, I don't know, everything runs together on me. This has been about 15 years ago at least. I was having a conversation with my dad, who at the time was n not yet a believer. And I want to say I was home from my first semester of Bible college. So this was in the summer. And so we're having a conversation. I still remember it. And I don't have any idea how we got talking about this. My dad was sitting on the lawnmower in the yard. And so I have no idea why we're having this conversation in the yard. But I remember having this conversation with my dad. And we're talking about salvation and different things. And, and we were talking about church. Of course, you guys know I grew up Lutheran. And my dad talking about going to church. And I said, Dad, why do you go to church? And he said, because it makes me feel good. I said, then you're going for the wrong reasons. Because we don't. We don't gather because it makes us feel good. We don't gather for what we can get out of it. Now, does it affect the way we feel? Are there benefits? Do we get things? Absolutely. But that's not our motivation. Our motivation for gathering is the understanding that we are privileged to come together as professing believers in Jesus Christ to, to, to pour into one another, to edify one another, to build one another up, and to see the gospel advanced. It's not selfish. It's not about how we feel. But there is great benefit. If you gather simply because you like the preaching of a certain pastor because you like the, the music or whatever, then you might not be gathering for the right reasons. And so we have to always be, as we said, with there being no room for selfishness, examining ourselves. Number three, what is the reason that you currently give for not serving and can you support it biblically? Now, this, this application point is a little more direct and hard-hitting. And it causes each and every one of us to say, why don't I serve in X, Y, Z, A, B, C? And some of us might say, well, I can't serve in that ministry because, you know, it's hard for me to do the nursery because I'm doing children's church. or so Like, okay, we understand those things. But that's why the question is phrased the way that it is. 
what is the reason that we don't serve, and can we support that reason biblically? If we can't, we ought to be serving. The old expression is what? 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. And if this is true, then we ought to ask ourselves why. Why is that the case? Lastly, I want you to understand, when you don't serve, you are robbing yourself of a blessing. There we say we finished with a tough one, and then we finished with an encouraging one. I cannot... I've tried in a couple of different examples, using Eva and her team as some things, but I cannot tell you the blessing that is experienced when you serve others and have the privilege of seeing the beginning of eternal fruit in the lives of someone. And you rob yourself of a blessing, no matter what the reason is, if you're not serving. The encouragement that comes really can't be described, but it can be experienced. When you see someone who you've served grow or benefit from your service, and the reward that comes with that is indescribable. And also I would add to you this, I personally believe there is no greater way to grow than to serve. So often we think, well, I will grow if I could just get somebody to teach me, if I could just get somebody to pour into me. One of the greatest ways to grow is to avail yourself to other people. It's to seek to pour in to them. It's to seek to be a part of something greater than ourselves. This is how we see, or this is how we experience the blessing of serving others and carrying out what we see the church called to in the Word of God. And so the reality is this morning is that servanthood is a sacrifice. It will, serving others will call you to sacrifice. You cannot serve others and not deviate in some way from what you were doing when you were not serving others. At least I don't know anybody that has enough time they can just keep adding things and adding things. And so servanthood requires sacrifice, but servanthood is the expectation from the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And servanthood comes with tremendous blessings. And so we ought to ask ourselves today, do we have servants' hearts? Are we motivated by serving others and seeing God glorified in what he does in the lives of other people and how it is that he's growing them up? And, and um, then we have to ask the Lord to search our hearts, examine ourselves and see where we're at, and why we are there. But the expectation is that we would serve, and servanthood requires sacrifice. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you today for your word, and God, we do thank you um, for a model. I, I say often when we finish a morning service that I'm so thankful, God, that you have not called us to something that you've not demonstrated how to do. And you've not left us to wonder, to figure it out, to put the pieces together ourselves. God, we have a model, and we have the, the right motives. And so, Father, challenge our hearts today. Challenge our hearts that we might be motivated by sacrifice to others, uh, or sacrifice for others in the form of servanthood. And God, may you be glorified through this, and God, may you make a difference uh, through your church and the world that we're in uh, each and every day for your glory and the good of those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.